sexy is this pretty loaded, right, energetically loaded adjective that I think many of us as women carry as a question, like who gets to determine whether we're sexy? And it oftentimes is posed as a question, like do you find me sexy? Am I sexy? Is the body I inhabit and the way I move my body, do those count as sexy and in whose eyes? Today, we welcome back Dr. Alexandra Solomon, psychologist, professor, and author of Loving Bravely, as well as her newest book, Taking Sexy Back. She is a renowned expert on relationships and sexuality and teaches the famous course Marriage 101 at Northwestern University on building healthy, intimate relationships. She has made appearances on The Today Show and has been interviewed for O Magazine, The Atlantic, Vogue, and Scientific American. We are so excited to have her back to talk about her new book on sexual self-awareness. So, so welcome back, Alexandra. We're so pleased to have you here again and wish it was in person, um, but here we are. It's great to be with both of you again, definitely. Yeah, good to see you. So we're here to talk about your new book, uh, Taking Sexy Back, um, that explores how women, especially young women, can find greater satisfaction in their sex lives through processing and examining their sexual selves. So can you tell us a little bit about what you mean by taking sexy back? Mm -hmm. Because that's a pretty, it's it's a great title for a book. And was it a reference to Justin Timberlake's song, (laughs) Taking (laughs) Sexy Back? (laughs) Justin was bringing sexy back. We are taking sexy back. But it certainly is. It certainly is, you know, a a play. Great inspiration. Yeah, a play on that whole. Yeah, that was a bold title, you know, as, as is the case with every book, right? the team is playing with all kinds of ideas and possibilities and you know I want the book to be called like a gentle compassionate journey into your interior that serves <laughs> you know your empowerment that doesn't sell no, not, not sexy sell. they were like we're gonna go with a bright pink bright orange cover called taking sexy back and I was like okay all right I surrender this is a partnership right part of what we do and partnerships is lean in and trust and um and that's the title and in some ways it is so perfect because what we do in the book is we take this, you know, adjective. Sexy is this pretty loaded, right, energetically loaded adjective that I think many of us as women carry as a question. Like, who gets to determine whether we're sexy? And it oftentimes is, a, is, a, is posed as a question. Like, do you find me sexy? Am I sexy? Is the body I inhabit and the way I move my body, do those count as sexy and in whose eyes? And so in this book, and so that, just right there, right, that sense of sort of, being um, being in somebody else's gaze is that first step towards detachment, disempowerment, you know, silence, um, separation from self. And so what we're doing is taking sexy back and we take it from an adjective and turn it into a noun. So the book is ultimately couples therapy between the reader and her sexy. So the H in her is capitalized and the S in sexy is capitalized. And it is about understanding like who is, like what is your sexy? Who is this part of you? And what messages does she carry that she no longer needs, that she didn't ask for? Um, And what does she need to know? And what do you need to teach her? And what is the healing that needs to happen between you and your sexy such that when you enter a sexual experience by yourself or with a partner, it really becomes an expression of you rather than a performance. I love that so much. I I think it's so easy to forget that it involves, that sex involves yourself. You know, so often we're really, we really learn to think about the other and that sex is about two people, but we forget that it's so much about inhabiting your own body. So I think that's really beautiful. How did you get from loving bravely to taking sexy back? Like what was, what was your kind of line of thought in, in that process? You know, I mean, like quite literally, the publishing company came to me a few months after Loving Bravely came out and they were like, what are you going to write next? And it was like asking, you know, a mama who just had a baby, like, when are you having your next baby? And I was like, I don't know. That was a really big endeavor. And don't I just get to, you know, savor this for a while? But I knew even as the question was being asked, like I knew there was something that felt 
really incomplete at the end of Loving Bravely, which is we, you know, we sort of open the door. One of the lessons of Loving Bravely is about sexual self-awareness. But as I was writing that chapter, I was just so aware of everything I wasn't able to say in that chapter. And, you know, it was this, so this book was sort of knocking around in my head for a while. And then it, it was the summer of 2017. So it was right as we were on the precipice of the Me Too movement. Um, mm. And so there was, so as we were so importantly as a culture, naming the violence, naming the power dynamics, naming the shame and the silence, I was, I was passionate and curious about figuring out how to add my voice into that conversation and how to invite us to not, to not leave out, um, part of empowerment certainly is like the saying no, right? Having the permission and the authority to say no. But the other part of empowerment is knowing how and when to lean into yes, right? Being able to really, in a permission giving, joyful way, be able to say yes. And so this book is really, was sort of born of you know, born of that, born of every therapy session I've ever done, born of teaching, you know, I've had the privilege of teaching college students for 20 years and working with graduate students, most of whom are um, women in their 20s. And so these have all been conversations. And you guys, I mean, both of you know so well in our field that sex and love kind of end up split from each other. And so I'm very excited about, you know, all of what we are doing now to integrate sex and love into the same conversation. I'm wondering what it's been like for you to work with uh, college students around sex, uh, getting more in touch with their sexual selves. And really, you, you know, you talk a lot about turning inward, mm -hmm. right, rather than always turning outward. Um, that that's really the the important thing to pay attention to, and I wonder just what comes up. What are what are the issues around turning inward mm -hmm. um, that come up when you're working with, particularly with young people, right? Uh, when they're so used to this outward facing way of being. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, my gosh, what a, like that has been, my, my undergraduate course has been just a massive classroom for me, right? Where I'm certainly teaching, but I'm also learning. And I'm so grateful for the, the conversations that my college students will engage with me on because all of it just helps me expand and understand like what does feel most urgent, most pressing, most um, complicated. And many of, I mean, many of my college students like absolutely have done a ton of this interior work, right? And so they have these like, ama many of them have ways of languaging their own interior that just like brings me to tears. It's so beautiful that at 20, 21, 22, they're able to identify their love languages, like talk about, you know, erectile challenges without, you know, flooding with shame, all of this, you know, for, so for many of them, this is, I'm sort of with them on their journey, but I didn't, I'm not starting their journey. But then for a whole lot of them, what they tell me is that my class, which is Marriage 101, a relationship education class, that my class is the first time they've ever, you know, heard a quote unquote grown up talk about sex without talking about, you know, shame, sin, disease, danger, risk, right? So it really is like the experiences are those are the two poles and then many students fall in between. But yeah, oftentimes what happens when students start to turn inward in my course, the first thing they meet on the inside of course is shame. Like just a, being convinced that they are wrong, their sexual self is wrong, especially in my queer, you know, for queer students that is oftentimes a, a big, you know, piece of healing, right? Is that just sense that my sexuality, my desire, my, um, what turns me on is just somehow wrong. But for many students, there's just, it's so easy to be sure that somehow the way I think about sex, the way I experience sex is, is off the mark, is weird. I'm not normal. And that makes it so hard to learn about sex when you're stuck in shame. Like it's to be, to be open, to be curious, shame has to kind of dissipate or take a little bit of a back seat, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the tenets of your sex ed that you teach to your students? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, then I also want to hear what you all find with your, with your clients as well, right? Because you're doing, you know, you are sitting therapeutically in relationships with, um, with emerging adults as well. So I'm so curious also what the kind of central themes are. But yes, in terms of sex, in terms of the sex education, like, 
the place I start is the sexual both and, that sex is both a behavior and a gateway into the deepest questions that we have as humans, right? So there's like this way in which is very simple, which is, I think, part of the problem with hookup culture is that sex is supposed to just be this simple thing, just supposed to just be this behavior that you can do without getting emotional, without getting activated, without making meaning. Um, so, so the first thing I want to do is really normalize that sex is both of those things at once. I also start um, with just really inviting an expansive definition of sex, right? Because we end up, we end up taking this definition that sex is a penis going into a vagina that, first of all, makes invisible all of our queer, um, all, all queer people's experiences, and then also just sets up the orgasm gap, right? So we know there's this, you know, the orgasm gap for heterosexual people, the he- orgasm gap between men and women um, is really striking. And, it, and it's been consistently found in the literature that he is much more likely to experience an orgasm than she is. And, you know, an orgasm isn't the sum total of a good sexual experience. You can have pleasure without orgasm. But it's at least something that, you know, ought to be on the table for the, for the taking. And so, um, and so the, if we define sex as just a penis going into a vagina, that behavior is not most 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 people with a vulva will say that's not necessarily the most um, guaranteed route to an orgasm for them, right? So if we hold up penetration as the most important sexual behavior or the most significant sexual behavior, we're sort of creating the conditions where those of the penis are going to feel pressure to perform because you have to get and keep an erection. And those of the vulva are going to feel like, well, crap, this is probably not going to work for me or may not work as well for me as oral stimulation or using your hands or all these other things that are somehow just considered like foreplay, like the appetizer before you get to the main event. Yeah. And I've noticed with some of the couples that I work with that oftentimes that ends up producing a real desire discrepancy between the the female partner and the male partner because she's either feeling disconnected from her body or she's feeling this pressure for penetration and they're kind of forgetting this whole other world, then her libido goes down and the, and the male partner ends up feeling kind of rejected or somehow um, like he he's unwanted or undesired. And so then he gets frustrated and then the woman feels even more pressure and it ends up becoming this whole kind of sexual cycle that becomes the like unspoken, you know, elephant in the room in the relationship. And, right. and I think like really being able to track what happens, because I think so often partners just think like, oh, I just don't like sex and my partner wants more sex and it's a lot of pressure. And so it ends up just really being this disconnection that evolves. Mm-hmm. I, I love the piece you're saying about tracking what happens, right? So tracking what happens, like really looking at like what is the sequence of events and if and that that kind of that rut or that assumption that everything we do has to lead up to this really does, I mean, as you're saying, creates the conditions of desire discrepancy and, um, and puts entirely too much pressure on both people. I think it's really powerful for those with a penis to experience that kind of liberation as well, right? That that's like, what if sex is, a, is more of a menu than a, kind of like a linear process? So it's not just about liberating her or inviting her into more voice. I think it's also inviting um, him into some more permission and creativity and like learning about his whole body as something that can both give and receive pleasure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was, I was just going to add one thing that the sexual menu is such a beautiful exercise that I've used in couples therapy around the idea of the appetizer being foreplay or things that even just get you into the mood, things that have nothing to do with the genitals, and then the actual main course, which is sex itself, and then the, the dessert, which is more like the aftercare and being able mm-hmm. to kind of think through what it all means to each partner and, and share it, I think is really big. I think pe- couples so often never talk about any of these these things. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's like talking about sex is, can be a really big constraint. And the research there is clear too, that the couples who are able to talk about sex tend to enjoy it more, of course, but where the heck are we supposed to have learned how to do that? Right. So in taking sexy back, we for sure may talk about like uh, different ways couples can scaffold that conversation. And, um, and it really is, I think it's like a, a, a practice makes 
practicing helps, right? The more you do it, the, the easier it is to talk about sex. And I love, right, just that language of aftercare or dessert, like that is such a piece of the intimacy is um, kind of sharing with each other what it, what the experience was like and um, and how it was. And it doesn't need to be, I think there's a fear that's going to be evaluative. And I think most of us who are compassionate human beings are deeply afraid of hurting our partner's feelings. So really creating the climate in which there's just a ton of curiosity, right? That this is our playground and there's a ton of curiosity versus the sense of like, we need to kind of constantly be working to hone our performance, which is just, that's a total buzz killer. And I found in therapy, when, when couples start to talk about sex in therapy and have been afraid of it before, they're very surprised by how easy it becomes. It's very difficult mm-hmm. in the beginning, but then quickly becomes uh, an easier conversation that can get really nuanced and... Um, even in the presence of a third, even in the presence of the therapist, I was thinking that I was thinking that I imagine for you, Sina, that it also is about your modeling for you know for both of you, for all of us, the way that we as therapists model that, right? So I think you know mm-hmm. maybe it's you're saying even in the presence of the third, but I wonder if maybe like because of the presence of the third, like because you maybe yeah. you know if you're if you're holding a deeply permission giving space and a really gentle space, like you're sort of, you're you're modeling that and you're modeling. I'm curious about this aspect of who you are not voyeuristically but really in a in, in a way that this is this is a space that's for the two of you and that you both deserve to experience as nourishing and connecting and so let's really explore it together and that i think that can just like what i find is it's just as you're saying it's just the spark like it's just that sense of like oh like it's okay like we can do this that that <laughs> mm-hmm. that just can start the whole ball rolling Totally. Yeah. And as a therapist, it's certainly taken a while for me to get over my embarrassment, (laughs) you know, to be able to sit there and be be calm and just be in a space of curiosity without feeling like I'm crossing some boundary myself with a with asking a particular question yes. or a hundred percent. So there's mm-hmm. yeah. right, right with yeah. couple, like there's and there's all kinds. There's any I feel like I can come up with any story for why this is awkward. Either the couple's older than me, or the couple is younger than me, or the couple's a different orientation than I am, or the couple is more conservative than I am, or they're more liberal than I. Like, I think there's just all these ways in which we can just kind of muzzle ourselves for fear of exactly what you're saying, fear of. Being being perceived as voyeuristic or nosy or awkward. And that was, yeah, the whole, that that was certainly like my own growing and in writing Taking Sexy Back, I was just so aware of the sort of parallel process between what I'm writing about in the book and the sort of chatter inside of my head about how I'm imagining a reader will perceive my words. Like, oh my gosh, she's like, some kind of wild sex creature or, oh my God, she's so constrained and so, you know, fuddy-duddy. Like it just is this, it was such a, like an isomorph, right? Of the Mm. tenderness of writing about sex really mirrors the tenderness of having sex, of talking about sex. I think it's so interesting too, because there's almost more vulnerability in talking about sex than having sex in some ways. You know, you really put yourself out there when you're articulating it. Like the act of sex itself, which of course is very vulnerable too. It's like we, we, we've been normalized to it more. Talking about it feels so much more taboo. And, and yeah, when you don't ask, I've found that if I don't ask my couples or even my patients about their sex life, it, it rarely comes up. So it's so important for therapists I think critical for therapists to be comfortable talking about it because then we model that it's, you know, if we avoid it, then our patients are going to pick that up. Totally. I think the best way to do that is just to make it part of your assessment, like just to make it part of your process of getting to know couples. Um, Because right, there's, you know, you hear these horror stories about therapists who don't know until many, many, many sessions in that this couple hasn't touched or made love in years. Um, and they didn't know because it didn't come up and it didn't come, the couple's not going to bring it up because couples, I mean, how would a couple know what sort of inbounds and out of bounds in couples therapy unless we as therapists are modeling it? So just um, even for those of us who aren't, you know, sex therapists, sort of, you know, asex certified sex therapists, we certainly, all of us who work with couples must be integrating those kinds of questions and that into the getting to know couples because that is part of how we get to know couples. Like this is part of their story. So something I, I wanted to ask you about um, that relates to the Me Too movement is is um, the idea of boundaries. So I have noticed this particularly with my female 
younger female or millennial female clients that who are dating that that is is probably one of the number one issues that that they bring up around like both the how to set boundaries with another person when to decide to have sex for the first time or be intimate in any way um how to you know um how to reject somebody in a kind way um you know, all of these things that come up where you're in the particularly in the beginning of a relationship like that negotiation of boundaries that happens mm -hmm. that can be very fraught with a lot of fear of hurting the other person um being being shamed um being hurt mm -hmm. yeah so i'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you help people think about their own boundaries right sexual boundaries right yeah, it's it is really it's such an essential essential such an, such an essential place to do work, isn't it? And I think it's a place, maybe more than any other place, where I can find myself getting quite triggered by like some of the like self helpy things that are out there that act as if you know there's a protocol or there's a, a sequence of events or you know if this then this and don't do this until this and not that until that, um, which is just a very subtle but powerful way of giving, we're talking about women here, giving women the message again that actually it's not about turning to your insides, it's about just figuring out where you are on this flow chart. And it reinforces a gendered thing, which is basically like, all the power you have, woman, is in the in in the kind of goal tending that you do, right? So don't have sex until you've heard A, B, and C, because your only power actually is in your power to say no, and all of the stuff that really takes her out of herself. And so the way that I have, the way that I, I want all of us to be having those conversations with women, especially emerging adult women, is just helping them understand, like, how would you know? How would you know? What would you be thinking? What would you be feeling? What would you be seeing in your partner? Um, like, articulating their own, their own sense of like, when is it a yes that is a really love-fueled yes? Versus a yes that's like a fear of if I don't, you're going to think I'm a prude or if I do, then you're going to think I'm a slut, you know, like getting like that discernment between love guided choices and fear guided choices. And whether it's a yes or a no is in fact to me much less important than helping her understand how does a yes feel and how does a no mm -hmm. feel. Mm -hmm. And we know that, you know, I think that's such a beautiful phase that our whole world of um, therapy is in is like really honoring the wisdom of the body. So those questions really are not like thinking. It really is like, what is your, what is your body? Like, what are you feeling in your chest, in your gut, you know, in your head? Like that those are the kind of um, like really helping her understand, identify and honor the cues of her, of her body. Like what is her compass? Not her friend, not her, you know, not the, her favorite Instagram influencer, but hers. That's, um, that to me is where that important work happens. Yeah. And that's so important because it can be, like you're saying, different for everybody, right? What, mm -hmm. what it's going to feel like and what signals that person's going to respond to versus not respond to. Yeah. Um, different. Di I wonder what different, yeah. sorry, different when Go she's ahead. 22 than when she's 25, you know? So it's sort of like whatever she's got figured, whatever she, if she's figured out her own flow chart, it may have worked perfectly for her when she was 22, but now she's 25 and now she's got to rethink it. And, you know, so. Go and ahead. it's kind I of like untraining yourself because I think the idea between kind of conflating shoulds and wants is so kind of embedded in our system so for so many of us and then it becomes really difficult to parse out. So I love this idea of like kind of retraining you and then reconnecting to your body and kind of listening to things that are kind of deep in the intuition, which many, mm -hmm. many of my clients, many of my, the women that I work with can't trust. They think, right. they, they, they question it when it comes up. Mm -hmm. What do women say, like, or or men? What do they say? What What are some of the cues that they describe when it's, um, what did you call it, like, like uh, a love choice, a love, or like a love fueled yes, a love fueled yes, mm -hmm. yeah. is exactly it's, it's exactly what you're saying, Simone. That it's like sort of um, 
it's it's a, a want rather than a should. So it feels like a want. And sometimes like sometimes it's almost like part of that retraining or unlearning is also like sitting down with a menu at a restaurant and looking at the menu and like listening from within about like what do I want to you know, feed my body or thinking about the day and the workout. What do, how do I want to move my body today? I think that we, especially as women have, have so many shoulds around food, around exercise, around pleasing men, around not pissing off men, around being, you know, honoring duty and responsibility, but honoring ourselves. Like I think all of these things. So, so I think sometimes the like the boundaries around sex are so complicated and so charged that sometimes the practice ground needs to be around some of these like simpler things around the, the other kinds of choices around I'm going to say yes to this project at work or I'm going to say no to this project at work you know like that becomes sort of the practice grounds for the more complicated yeses and the more complicated noes um, and I think you know I think especially for heterosexual people a lot of this is about helping men unlearn and relearn, right? Because men are loaded up with these toxic messages around leadership, around deep, deep fears of rejection, around conflating her sexual rejection with um, you're saying that I'm worthless or that I'm not man enough or so that so that the no, you know, means just kind of keep figuring out how you're going to get to a yes. I mean, all this awful stuff that men um, internalize, like that's, I'm so... For as much as I love working with women in my college class, I love the work I get to do with men and like watching them make connections with how much they have been taught that their self worth depends on, you know, how they are, how they're perceived in a female's eyes. You know what I mean? Like uh, yeah. that. that pa- patriarchy hurts men too. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Right. And she can't. I think it's so. I I struggle with how much we're always asking her to figure out her boundaries when a lot of this is also like asking him to figure out his boundaries, like how to, how to read, you know, how to read the scene and how to go back to his own like natural organic ability to be empathic, you know, to sum up a situation, to read the feedback. We all know how to read feedback. Yeah. It seems like to be, to be curious rather than immediately taking a signal personally or stepping into shame or feeling rejected like rather to get really curious and be and, you know be empathic yeah that makes a lot of sense yes yeah. and in ways in which men can feel shame if um straight again straight men if if she's ready to be intimate sooner than he is right so i think that's another struggle we one of the myths we have is that male sexuality is like always ready to go and just waiting for a moment. And the research, like we had um, Dr. Kristen Mark's research about male sexual desire, you know, she had a lot of, this is, I think, more of an older married population where the, you know, men struggle a lot with sexual desire. But even with my college students, like I have had a number of men talk to me about how much pressure they can feel to be sexually ready, um, ready to be intimate, ready to move into that, into that phase, and then feeling some amount of shame, like, am I, you know, is, am I going to be perceived as unmanly if I'm not ready to be intimate yet? If I want to have a bit more safety, a bit more trust, a bit more connection before we add that layer. Something that that comes up in, in some of my work with my clients is this idea that a lot of women have been taught that pleasure is bad or like it's it's undeserving. And I'm wondering how maybe in the book or even working with some of your students, um, how do you help kind of young people or, or older people kind of um, learn that, that pleasure is good and positive and, and reconnect to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, so I had um, a year ago, I had an undergraduate student who was doing her honors thesis and um, I was on her committee and she looked at, she found three of the most sort of like quote unquote woke sex ed curricula for adolescents Um uh, and she did a sort of um, uh, content analysis for particular themes. One of the themes was around pleasure. And even in these, you know, really um, progressive curricula, pleasure was basically an afterthought. It was barely even mentioned. And so, it, so we co- we come by that. I think for women, it's a perfect storm because we aren't taught it in sex ed, and we are taught that putting other people first is what makes you a, you know, a good woman, a good mother, a good wife, a good whatever, um, 
that that's a very much bound up in our um, gender role expectation. So it's like we get this double whammy. And so I think that that oftentimes is like a, I think a simple or interesting place to start is looking at like, how did, you know, how much permission did you see the women in your family um, give themselves for pleasure, not sexual pleasure, obviously, but like, did your mom, you know, how would your mom, like, would she show you like kind of like savoring flavors or scents or like sort of this, you know, it's all about the five senses. And so did you see women, you know, kind of overworked, martyring themselves? Or did you see women really making space for pleasure, enjoyment, slowing down, um, not always having like a, a goal in mind? And so kind of unpacking all of those messages can be a place to start. Um, and then I mean, I think one of the coolest, like, I, I have found, like, one of the coolest things in this last couple of years of researching this book and writing this book and talking about it is just, like, there's a way in which, like, talking about the clitoris is such a fun entryway into pleasure because, you know, again, in sex education, the vast majority of us don't, you know, we, we maybe saw a diagram of the internal reproductive orgasm, uh, or reproductive um, uh, organs of a woman, right? We saw, like, the fallopian tubes and the ovaries, which is an interesting way of like reminding us that our genitals are about reproduction, not pleasure. And so medical. Uh huh. How many Uh of us ever saw a diagram of the outside, right? The external genitalia, because if you show, you know, a teen that you got to talk about the clitoris, if you talk about the clitoris, now we're basically reckoning with the fact that those of us who are born with a vulva are born with an entire sex organ that has one purpose and one purpose only, which is pleasure. So that right there, like, that's another really easy way in. It's like, listen, your body and like the generations of, you know, vulvaed bodies before you came into this world with this part that is just for pleasure. So pleasure is quite literally your birthright. I think that mm. can be like, that can be really destigmatizing and kind of, like, I love all the stuff we're seeing like these days of like, you know, clitoris jewelry and clitoris art and the sort of like reclamation of the clitoris is because it just is, it just is what it is, right? We're not analyzing it. It just is that this is this, this is in my body. This is what this part of my body wants. And so now it just sort of, it takes away the evaluation. I love that. I, I'm, I'm writing it down. Pleasure is your birthright. Cause I just think that's such a powerful statement. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think that can help, right? I think that can really help. It's like, it, you're, no, you're not dirty for wanting that this, you aren't too much for wanting this. This is, this is your body. It's this your is biology. You. Mm-hmm. Right, mm-hmm. you're meant to do this. Yeah. You're meant to you're do meant this. You're meant to have this yes. experience. Yes, mm-hmm. and expanding yeah. the definition of pleasure. I think that's a really important point you made, which is like, it's it's about all these ways in which we cut out pleasure from our lives, and being able just to kind of notice what you enjoy, like wrapping yourself in a warm blanket or taking a bubble bath, or all these things that are part of sexuality in many ways, setting us in the mood, getting us in touch with our bodies, and that that really should be also a part of reclaiming sex Mm -hmm. and feeling sexy. I love that. Right. That then I think it kind of, it makes me think about masturbation where we have like, you know, masturbation is self-pleasure. And so what you're saying is like, you're taking a really expansive definition of masturbation. It's all of the ways in which we honor our bodies and like the interface between our interior and our exterior, like the blanket and, you know, rubbing our arm or, you know, playing with our hair. Like these are all ways in which we are just comforting, awakening, you know, pleasing. Yeah. I was just curious about, because you see so many young people you have you occupy like a really interesting position right because i don't think a lot of older adults or adults i mean we you know i have some clients who are uh in their early 20s but most are in their 30s right and i'm wondering if you see ways in which the culture i guess in which the culture is moving in the right direction and the wrong direction around um sexuality yeah, I'm curious your thoughts on this on this as well. I I do think like I um uh I'm thinking about the the new Cardi B video, you know, WAP. Um WAP, WAP, I can't remember how to say it. WAP. 
I think we say what. <laughs> you know, which is like this total unapologetic, like wet ass pussy. Like it is just right out there, right? And it is in some ways mm-hmm. so incredibly extreme and in our faces, but in some ways, like maybe it's what we need, right? Is this like unapologetic, mm-hmm. like this is what my body does. This is my pleasure is like, I have permission to feel pleasure. I have permission for my pleasure to be messy and wet and like exactly the way that my body is, um, is, is making it be rather than, I think there's so much like there's, you know, we were talking about sort of fear of pleasure. Um, but I think it goes both ways, right? Like I, um, I remember a young woman telling me a story about her for, in her first sexual experience, she had an orgasm and she squirted on her male partner, mm-hmm. you know, who was also a you know young person, had no frame for this and was like grossed out and critical. And so then it just immediately cemented for her, her body mm-hmm. did, did this thing that she was not planning on it doing um, and she was shamed for it. So like, it's, mm-hmm. it's sort of like we get, you know, many of us feel badly for not not being able to have orgasms. Many of us feel badly for having them too quietly, too loudly, being too wet, being too dry. Like it's sort of all of this, um, It again, like how easy it is to import shame. And so I think sometimes I, I think about things like that new song, at least if we're singing about it or dancing about it or rapping about it, like it's putting it out there, right? Like shame shame does not do a good job of persisting in the light of day, right? So um, so I do think there's like, there are some kind of encouraging, fun signs like that. Um, certainly I love, like I have, I follow a number of accounts and have done quite a bit of work with different, like really feminist, like sex toy companies, um, mm. you know, that like Dame products. I love everything that they do. So it's this very like beautiful, holistic, um, understanding of female pleasure with these sex toys that are designed, you know, with female pleasure in mind. I think there's all kinds of encouraging the science of pleasure, like the OMG Yes group mm-hmm. that's really, mm-hmm. really understanding female orgasm and female pleasure. I think for a long time it was like female orgasm, like we just don't know. It's such a mystery. But it turns out if you just ask women <laughs> what helps them come, they will tell you. Like they've got all kinds of things to say, but just for a long time, nobody was asking. So I think there's a bunch of encouraging signs. Um, I've had, this is a really fun one too, like because I am on this bridge, like I've, I have the, have had the moms of teens, you know, come to me and be like, do I get my daughter a vibrator? Like at what point is it okay for my daughter to have a vibrator? Like I want her to understand her body and know how to please herself. But like that feels really kind of taboo. And, you know, I think that like I, my mom, I'm really sure, was not ever worried about my, you know, pleasure uh, in, in my, you know, like what was, you know, would I be able to, how my own sense of my sexual self-awareness was. I'm quite sure she wasn't concerned with that. But I do think a lot of women my age are thinking about how, you know, talking to our daughters about this stuff, making sure they understand their bodies. So that's all. I guess I am more, as I say all this, I'm, I realize I'm more encouraged than I am discouraged. Yeah. What do you guys no, think? I what love you, that. What do you think? Are you? Yeah. Are you, I, I, you know, um, yeah, I also had a positive reaction to the WAP song. Is it WAP? <laughs> I don't know. Whatever. Um, because it is just like putting everything out there and, and destigmatizes, reduces shame around female wetness mm-hmm. and, um, I think that's very powerful. I do. I, I feel concerned about the amount of pornography um, that uh, men, heterosexual men, watch, and how it, it seems to be increasingly degrading. Like it gets wilder and crazier and more violent. Um, so that that to me seems concerning. But then there are other there are other things that that like you mentioned, you know, like female sex products and, and, um, also like porn that's more geared towards women and and that type of stuff that, that feels encouraging and optimistic. But I feel like, uh, yeah, both are at work at the same time. Mm -hmm. Um, that there, that there's, there's a lot that's also really problematic and that, that parents for sure, um, especially in our culture, are still terrible at talking about sex with their children and teens. Um, like there's still a lot yeah. of silence around sexuality. It's almost like people have that awakening in college, but it feels right. late. That's right. That's right. 
Yeah, I, I agree. I agree, Sina, with you about these two forces. And I've noticed that a lot of, I mean, it's beautiful because mainstream culture is, I think, becoming more open with sexuality. And I think more people are talking about it. And I've really noticed kind of more playfulness around experimentation or gender fluidity or just all these things that involve sexuality. But a lot of it can sometimes it's like apply to other people and not always to the self. Like when I then think about my clients, it's like, well, of course, you know, all of these different ways of experimentation and being open and empowered sexually is a good thing, but I don't feel that way. Um, And so I think that's where I see sometimes those two forces contradicting. It's like people, many young people can understand it in a rational way, maybe even more than older generations, but there's still all these old pressures and these all uh, old gender norms that are still somehow kind of deeply embedded there too. Yes. And, and I think what you're saying also apply, like that there's, that then if there is a lot of like permission giving and sex toys and feminist porn, it kind of creates this idea of like, I should be okay. And so now my shame does a double loop because mm. I have the sense that like everybody else is empowered, everybody else is free, everybody else understands the exact nuances of sexuality, and so now here I am, confused, and so I I think that's another like a interesting like side effect of this sort of empowerment or conversation is it kind of creates this idea of like oh my god everybody else is okay and I'm still back here trying to figure out what the hell turns me on or figuring out how to not you know feel guilty about my pleasure. Mm-hmm. That's or so understand true. my pleasure, right? Under peel, yeah, yeah, right, right, mm-hmm. and and have that space to explore it in a safe way. I, I was just talking to a client just this week about a game. Um, it's sort of like the, a never have I ever, but just applying to sexuality. And she really felt a lot of shame because not mm-hmm. only did she feel like she hadn't kind of performed the same kind of sexual behaviors as her as her friends, but then also she was embarrassed to talk about it. And there was this, this, this pressure, like, if you can't talk about it, you must be a prude or you must not be comfortable or you have problems. And, um, and right. And that, and that was the compounded, that compounded pressure. Not only should I be doing more, but I should be feeling free and open to talk about it. Right. Right. And who the heck knows with the the person who has this like amazing resume of all the kind of, um, things that they have done, how much do they really feel deeply connected to themselves when they were having those experiences versus feeling like I have to do it to check a thing off my list so that I'm not, a prude. I'm not da, da da da. So yes, I think that's it. Also, is like it's not just the. I think about this a lot in terms of like the idea of virginity, right? Like that's it is virginity is this like very bizarre socially constructed notion of a behavioral description, whether or not you've had this one particular sex act that like masquerades as an entire narrative about worth and cuts both ways. People who have lost their virginity who feel ashamed of it. People who haven't lost their virginity who feel ashamed of it. So it just is like such, um, yeah, that, that story, um, Simone, is like a, a reminder that it's about the behavior, but it's mostly about the experience of it, right? And the degree to which you can feel aligned and self-compassionate about, about our choices, whatever they are. Mm-hmm. Well, I think your, your book does a good job of Sort of providing a space for people to do self exploration and not step into shame, mm-hmm. right? And like it's just um, being open and curious, mm-hmm. rather than feeling like this pressure, like like it's like I sh- I should be at this particular level at this particular time. I should have figured it all out, right? Um, so yeah, and how much would we love for that gal who's playing Never Have I Ever, like for that group to be able to like go meta and be like, you guys, like let's talk, like let's unpack why we're playing this game and like what are the messages and stories that we're overlaying. I love that. <laughs> on top yes. of, you know, like it's just like because it's a, it's fat, like that's a fascinating conversation for a group right. of young people to have. Right. Why? Why are we compelled to sort of dare and reveal in this way? And what and what are we afraid of? Showing? What are we proud of showing? What's what is it like to have a difference? All these differences present in the room, and you know right. that would just be a, a beautiful way to take. Why them. are we ignoring shame? <laughs> right, right. Here, That's know. actually a really good thing to take away. Is just this idea of going meta. Like I feel like so often that's missed. I mean, that's what so much of therapy is. What is it like to be talking about it? How is it to be sharing this? Or what should we be talking about? How do we negotiate? 
And I think that's a really, I mean, I'm just thinking that's like just a good slogan. <laughs> like just go meta. Like if you're, if you're feeling uncomfortable or you're not sure where to go, like talk about it with yourself, talk about it with the person, but talk about how, you know, how this is for you rather than mm -hmm. just the content. So I know we have to wrap up. Sorry, did you want to say something, Alexandra? Mm -hmm. Nope. Nope, nope, nope. I'm good. Um, <laughs> but um, I'm wondering kind of if, if we were to take a step back, and, and obviously people should read the book, Taking Sexy Back, because there's so many good bits in that. But if you were to think about a piece of advice that maybe we haven't touched on that you would want to give to our listeners around sexual self-awareness and kind of tuning in, is there any... Anything in particular, either where to start or, or something that you think is just like a really good um, tip or technique that you've, that you've really found effective that you would want to share? Hmm. I know that's a big it's question, so, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And well, and you, you know, and you know, because you've, because you've taken a look at the book that, um, you know, as a therapist who practices in an integra integrative way, right, where I'm always pulling together sort of thinking and feeling and doing and cultural messages, the, the, that's what the book does, right? The book sort of takes us on this journey through these seven different lenses through which we experience our sexual selves. And so I guess, um, I guess that would be like the frame that I really want us all to hold is that this is complicated. And it's not complicated because you are stupid or damaged or weak or slutty or prudish or silly. Um, it's complicated because it's complicated. And, and that it's also dynamic. And it's going to be, as we were saying before, like whatever we figure out when we're 22, we have to figure out maybe even when we're 25, but certainly we have to figure out again, you know, in our 30s and 40s and 50s because we are, we change and our context changes. Um, and then I think it's also, I think especially if we're thinking about um, emerging adults or people who are dating, I think it's also easy to forget that the person that we are dating or the person that we're considering becoming intimate with comes in with their own history as well, right? I think there's a way we can kind of um, simplify the other person and imagine that they sort of have it figured out or only want one thing or that this is very clear for them and muddy for us. And so kind of honoring, um, honoring that there are, that we each are bringing in our, our sexual histories, our sexual stories, um, and that that's all worth looking at together. And that that's what really a good relationship is, right? A relationship where we can just kind of be in the mess together and um and looking curiously at our own experiences and our partner's experiences i love that right. it's really beautiful yeah it reminds me kind of of um we interviewed Susanna Izenza mm -hmm. and she has she, she said this thing about like all sex is group sex like um, you know, each person has their the people they've been with and their experiences and all the experiences that those people have had and their parents and all those messages. So it's messy and complicated. I like love said. that. I love that. Which is why, which is why we need mindfulness, right? Like that's the the ga the woman who wrote the forward taking sexy back, Dr. Lori Brado is a is a researcher in Canada and she has she's taught women mindfulness and had these beautiful results around increased pleasure and lubrication and orgasm and desire like her results are beautiful and they really remind us that yes it is all group sex and which is why it's so beautiful that when we're when we're engaging sexually we get to just come back to the moment right we can just come back to the sort of simplicity and presence of the moment in the midst of all that complexity. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining us. This was so much fun. So good to be with you both.